So Justin Wynn was supposed to be my little partner in crime here. Um, has anyone heard of the Iowa court case in the states where the pen testers were arrested? Yes, well, Justin was one of those pen testers. <laughs> so you can see here, this is his shiny mug. Uh, I, it is still an ongoing court case, so I can't say like too much, um, too much about it, but I'll say what's public. Uh, what's public is that the state of Iowa contracted me and my company, not me specifically, but uh, I did this gig four years ago. Justin got it this year. They were doing a red team. Red teams mean like basically anything goes. Uh, you can fish them. You can impersonate an employee. You can do all kinds of things uh, that a normal adversary would do. Now, the Iowa court system didn't exactly or may not have, I don't really know, may not have had permission to give us permission to break into some of these courthouses. There was some confusion about the language of the statement of work. There were some other like minor things, but uh, ultimately it comes down to the, s the state didn't really technically have permission to, to uh, allow us to do that. So the county cops show up. They pick a lock or something and they open the door and uh, the county cops show up because they tripped a silent alarm. And there they say, oh, hey, no, it's no big deal. We were hired to do this. Here's our get out of jail free card. And in this case, the county cops were like, I, I don't respect this. I don't care that you have this card that says you're allowed to do this because it's 1 a.m. in the morning and you're breaking into a courthouse. They're like, oh, okay, well, I guess we're going to jail then. So they go to jail for like a, for a day. They eat some terrible ham sandwiches and then our company bails them out. So that's why Justin is not here today. And I'm a little, a little miffed about that, but uh, you know, if he was better at red teaming, he wouldn't have been caught, so. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do, uh, he had some great stories too, uh, you'll be missing out on those, but uh, I have plenty of stories myself. So what I'm gonna do is tell you five techniques that I use to break into uh, about 80% of the buildings that I'm hired and contracted to break into. Uh, these are gonna be the, the default techniques that you're gonna wanna use that don't require any skill. I'd like to make that one pretty clear. Uh, I'm not gonna, lock picking is not gonna be one of these. Uh, these are gonna be just five techniques that we use to bypass security mechanisms, not necessarily brute force our way in. Lock picking, interestingly enough, is actually considered destructive entry because when you're doing, a, when you're picking a lock, you can actually break one of the pins or cause damage to the lock that makes it so the lock can't turn anymore. Uh, so a lot of places when they contract you for physical security assessments will not allow you to pick any locks to get in. Uh, that's actually been the most common situation. It's, it's somewhat rare that we get to pick a lock. So I'm going to show you the five techniques. We're going to start with uh, technique number one, which is make some friends. This we're going to exploit people instead of the actual mechanism. These people specifically. The cleaning crews in buildings are almost always independent contractors. They do not work for the company that leases the building and they don't have a lot of security training. So they don't really care that much when someone who's nicely dressed and has a briefcase and a name badge comes up to the door and, and gently knocks and goes, oh, I forgot something, can you let me in real quick? And gets their grubby little hands all over the documents they want. So I'm gonna illustrate these five techniques with one engagement I did where I got to use all five of these techniques. It was a bank job, it was four branches, we were contracted to break into four branches and one headquarters. And once we had broken into the first branch, we more or less had one. We're on the internal network, we had sensitive documents and all that kind of stuff. But I was with um, one of the newer guys to the company and I also am just a hooligan and I wanted to just keep going and going and going. So once that first night was done, then it was just like playtime. And I'm like, okay, let's just hit the check boxes on every single one of these. So number one, number one way we got in was the cleaning crew. Uh, it was Monday night. It was a two-week engagement. Monday night rolls around, and uh, about 5 or 6 p.m., I hop in my car with my partner in crime, and we get some snacks, and we get you know some, some water and drinks, and we camp out on the hill with some binoculars, and we just watch the bank branch that we were t t tasked with breaking into. Now, what I'm looking for is, A, what time does the cleaning crew come? B, what are they, uh, what are they wearing? Uh, do they lock the door behind them? Do they prop the door open? What doors are they exiting and entering from? Is there a bush I can go hide in? Can I put a ghillie suit on and just like hide next to the door? And as soon as they go in, can I just sneak on in? Because the whole point is just to get in there. As soon as the cleaning crew opens that door, you know it's not going to be alarmed. There's not going to be a silent alarm going off. The cleaning crew is opening that door. It's extremely safe to tailgate or otherwise trick these people into letting you in. Now what I did, uh, Monday night we scouted it out about 7 p.m. 
a single guy comes in there and he opens up the door and then he locks it behind him and he starts cleaning. He looked like a very nice man. He was also clearly not employed by the bank. He was employed by this third party contractor service. So that's good too because now he's not gonna know whether my fake outfit and, and all that is actually accurate. So I get my suit on, Tuesday night rolls around, get my suit on, 6 p.m., I've got my fake name badge. I harvested the bank's Twitter account and found some uh, new hire photos and they had their little name badge right there. So a, 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 sli a slight side note, as we were trying to get these badges, I went to a badge making service and I said, hey, can I get this badge that says like chief of IT operations or whatever for XYZ bank? And they're like, they look at me a little suspiciously and they're like, okay, all right. And they leave for like 15 minutes and I'm just sitting there like, this, this is probably not good. I, I don't really have, like how am I gonna convince these people that I'm, I'm actually here for good? So about 15, 20 minutes later, they roll back into the, uh, into the office and they say, uh, come with me real quick. And I'm like, oh, crap. So I start walking, you know, doing the walk of shame to their office. She closes the door and locks it behind her. And I'm like, first of all, I don't think that is like the safest way of going about this if I was a real criminal. But as soon as I saw that, I knew that she suspected something was amiss. Uh, apparently, meth heads do this a lot. I had no idea, but they were in a, they were like an industrial sign supply company and they made a lot of badges and stuff. And so I wanted to get this fake badge. And apparently people come in and try and get fake badges like pretty commonly. And they're usually trying to get drugs out of it somehow. So he, she's like grilling me in that room. And I give her the contact information for the, the one guy at the bank that knew I was doing the job. And, and she, he settles her down and everything. Um, and I'm thinking about how to circumvent this process. And honestly, I just gave her essentially my letter of authorization and I gave her a phone number. And she called the phone number. The guy says, yeah. I hired this guy to break into my bank. And then she's like, okay, great. And she prints me my badges. So I'm sitting there thinking like, maybe there's a missing step here. You're locking me in the room. You're not really verifying anything. It doesn't matter because I got my badge. So I put my badge on and I head down to the bank branch. I got my briefcase on and the key is to look as unthreatening as possible. So I drive my car up to the front door. I park my car right in front of the front door. I get out with my briefcase, my suit on, and a, and a kind of a you know, happy, dumb looking grin. Go up to the door, like look around a little bit, a little half smile on, knock gently, wave real friendly. And as soon as he opens the door, he just cracks it a little bit and he's like, hey, what's, uh, what's going on here? And I'm like, I just forgot my brief, I forgot some documents, I have to get this out before 7 p.m. Is there a chance that you can just let me in for a split second? I'm gonna run in there, I'm gonna grab my stuff, and I'll get out of your hair. And he's like, yeah, of course, of course. And he just opens the door, and now I'm in. Now I'm doing network drops, now I'm taking pictures of sensitive information. The, the one time that we could pick locks, in this case, was for file cabinets. They allowed us to pick file cabinet locks. File cabinet locks are extremely easy to pick, and banks think that file cabinet locks are like safes. They're, they are nothing like safes. So as soon as I got into the manager's office, I'm picking all of her, uh, her wafer locks on her, on her um, file cabinets open, and there's just, you know, I mean, there's famous people's financial documents and stuff. It was like an, an MVP client list. So I just had all of their taxes and everything. So I'm feeling good about this. I'm feeling like this is going to be a good week. I'm going to have a good time. Uh, we're pretty much done. I mean, we have network access. We can, we can do whatever we want. At this point, now we can just start breaking into all the other places just for fun and, and giggles. Uh, technique number two. This was the second bank branch we broke into. This is the hall pass, and the hall pass, this is my bag, it looks like this. This is a hall pass. I like to call this thing the key to the city because this thing is amazing. So when you look at a door latch, this is the most common thing you'll see. It's sort of a D shape, like a curved D shape and a flat back. When you lock this door, you are not locking that latch in place. You're locking the door handle in place. This latch can still move freely. So when you shut the door and you lock the door, what you can do is just take this thing, hook the latch, and then just pull it out. And that forces the latch to go in, and now you're inside the door. This, this is amazing. So this is actually a really, really good tool for getting into rooftops. I'm a big fan of going to rooftops. Uh, whether you're technically allowed to or not. And when you're not allowed and that door is locked, this thing almost always gets you in. Now there's a few caveats to this, uh, or a few different tricks. Let me show you how it works real quick. Just, it'll make it easier. Because it's easier to see than it is to explain. So you see, you just slide it between the frame and the door. You hook the latch. And then just tilt it up. 
and it reaches behind and pulls on this until it slides in and enables you to exit. Now this video makes it look super easy and it, s half the time it is that easy. You literally just swipe it. Uh, there's a couple tricks though that you got to know if you're going to be doing this um, professionally. One trick is when the, the door latch is really in there tight. So the, the tolerances on the door latch are really good and the door frame is real tight on that door latch. You're not going to be able to just slide it and pull it. You're going to have to put a lot of force into it, which is why I have a carry a metal one. Uh, what you can do, the trick here is to take off your shoe, you hook the latch, you take off your shoe, you get underneath it, and you jam straight up. That gets you a ton of leverage against a really tight uh, latch that will let you get into a lot of these doors. The second trick here is if there's a door guard, people are sometimes getting smart to this and they'll put this little door guard on the door and this was supposed to prevent exactly what we're doing, the hall pass attack. However, Justin Wynn had a good story about this one. Uh, there's two ways to bypass this. Number one is a shoelace. You can take a shoelace and you can just thread it from the top all the way down to the bottom, making sure you're behind the latch, and then just put your foot against the frame and just jerk it. That'll open up. That'll, uh, that's my go-to. That's not always going to be possible, though, because sometimes door frames have these weird, like, angles in them. You've got to take, like, a right angle and a left and a right and a left and a right, and you've got to go around this kind of maze to reach the latch. In order to bypass that, Justin Wynn and actually the, his friend that he was doing the engagement with that also got arrested made a, a kind of a clever technique that I've never seen or heard anyone else doing. I'm not sure if they made this up themselves or if it was something that you know, they picked up on the way. But these are your best friend. These are dollar cutting boards on Amazon. They are stiff but flexible. So what you can do is cut this notch into the side of one of those cutting boards or the corner of one of those cutting boards. Cut that notch in there, and that thing is just the perfect amount of flexible and stiff to go around all the little edges, and the trick there is to put it in corner side first. You want to jam a corner in, kind of slide it down a little bit, and then start working it up and down as you work it in. That's the trick with these things. So they're doing that, and they're doing this against a very famous museum, I guess I'll say. Uh, it's about 1 a.m. as usual, and they can't get into this building. It's, uh, it, was, it was very tricky. The social engineering wasn't working. The security's quite good, but they found a side door, and the side door did not appear to have a lot of security on it. It did, however, have a door latch. So they're thinking, okay, this is our target. This is the softest spot that, of, of the exterior of this really famous museum. So what they did is they ordered these on Amazon, overnight shipped them, cut the notch in, and 1 a.m., they, they go back to that door and they start sliding it around. And the security footage of this is some of the greatest TV I've ever seen. What you see in this grainy TV image, you see it's from the inside. The camera's on the inside facing, uh, pointing at this door entrance. They're on the outside and they're, they're wiggling this thing. So you see on the camera, all is still and quiet. And all of a sudden, you see this little piece of plastic start wiggling its way inside the door frame, just going up and down, slowly but surely. And then you see the janitor come into frame. And the janitor is looking at this thing for a solid 15 seconds or so before he finally knocks on the door. And you see in the camera, you see this, this little yellow cutting board stop dead in its tracks and slowly retract from that door frame. <laughs> I don't remember if they actually got in uh, through that method or not, but uh, that, that camera footage just cracked me up. So the, two tech, so the three techniques, this was one technique with two different uh, tricks that you can do. The hall pass is the simple one. If it's a real easy one, you just slide it. If you have a door blocker like this, you use either a uh, shoelace or a piece of plastic. So those are two tricks that uh, I don't think are very well known, but work really well for breaking into buildings. Uh, one thing to note about this is that the hall pass generally won't get you past exterior security. Sometimes it will, but most of the time ex you're going to use the hall pass on the interior of the building. So for doors that have like RFID cards, readers and stuff, for sensitive areas in the finance sector and stuff like that, you're not going to see a lot of doors that are vulnerable to this. Uh, maybe 20% maybe of the time, something like that. It's hard to put percentages on here, but in my experience, it's about 20% of the time. On the inside, though, these things get you everywhere, absolutely everywhere, and rooftops, too. 
man, you have not had a good date until you brought a girl up to a rooftop who did not know that she was going up to a rooftop. Technique number three is the breaker bar break-in. Now, I see this less in Europe, but I do still see them here, but these are everywhere in America, these double doors. I love, love, love seeing these double doors. These double doors mean it's probably going to be an easy engagement. There's at least three different methods of breaking into these doors. Let's talk about the easiest one. This is a breaker bar. These will open the door even if it's locked from the inside. So the whole point of this is to make sure that if someone is trapped in a fire, they can just run at this door and just slam it like a linebacker and it'll open up even if it's been locked previously. Now this leaves a giant gaping security hole because of this. Our tool works exactly the same. You slide it in through the crack between the doors. You can kind of feel around and you can find out exactly where that bar is. And once you do, you pull and you get that bolt to retract. Too easy. That is it. Whenever you see one of these doors, that technique is going to work most of the time alone. Uh, it's very, very rare that you'll see tolerances between those two doors that's small, that's tight enough that you can't fit something in there. And you don't have to use this tool specifically. Uh, the one he's using here, exactly the same. This. Slide it in through. this tool here is a Sparrows tool. I actually am not a huge fan of this tool because it's a little bit thicker than it has to be because it's got like a rubberized coating on it, I guess for grip or something, but it's failed me in the past because it's a little too thick. Uh, you can use pretty much any piece of thin metal though. You can just go to Lowe's, go to their like metal bar aisle and then just get one of those really tiny metal bars and just bend it into an L shape. Shove that between the door, turn it, open the door right up. That is it. Now the, there is a, a trick to this one too. You'll see on the bottom of this tool, there's that little, little notch in the bottom. I don't know if you can see it here. It's right in the very bottom. It's a little U shape. That little U shape is for a secondary method of getting into these doors. If it's dead bolted, you're not going to be able to hit the breaker bar and open it up. The dead bolt's going to stop you. But you can still slide that tool through the double doors and then hit that dead bolt latch. That little latch right there is always going to be on the inside and it's usually not a key most of the time. If, it's, if it is a key and it's a dead bolted, you're going to have to pick it. There's not really a way around that. Uh, but most of the time it's not going to be a key, it's going to be a hand latch because again, they want people to be able to escape in the, in the case of a fire. So what you can do is you shove that tool between the two double doors and then you just use that little, that little thing at the end of this. Our tool works exactly the same. You should... That little notch U-shaped thing at the bottom of that, you can use that to hook the latch for the deadbolt and then just flip the latch open. So. These doors are your best friend. These things are amazing. And this was, oh, you know what? I didn't tell you about how I got into the bank for this last one. I'm going to back up real quick. So we used uh, one of these brink branches had exactly this, had this door jam here. And uh, I just used um, a shoelace. The shoelace worked perfectly, slid it over the top, put the foot. Yeah, that store wasn't even worth going back for. All right, so moving into the breaker bars. The headquarters building, though, this is where we used the, the, uh, the double doors. The headquarters building, most headquarters buildings are going to have these large double doors because companies need to get big carts through these doors. They need to get like big objects through. It's almost never going to be a single door. Now, in order to get into the headquarters building, I did in fact use this technique, number four. To get into the bank branch, I used the Sparrows tool. So the Sparrows tool had I couldn't use the Sparrows tool because it was too thick to get into the bank branch. So what I ended up doing was exactly what I said earlier. When I went to Lowe's, I found a piece of metal. I just bent it to an L shape, put it through the door, and then flipped the deadbolt latch. That opens me right up into this bank. Uh, and for s you may be asking, what about in the case of alarms? And Justin would say, yes, alarms are scary and they will get you arrested. In my experience, sound alarms are really uncommon. They're just exceptionally uncommon. And secondarily, if you're going into a place that's secure enough that you think it might have a, a silent alarm, like a bank, uh, you're going to just want to be in and out as fast as possible. It, it doesn't take long to do damage as a bad actor in a bank or one of these buildings. You're talking three minutes uh, a pop. So if you jump in there, you trip, trip the alarm, and then you just throw your network jack into the wall, so now you have remote access into their network, well, you now have the crown jewels. I mean, you can start... Uh, 
using responder and capturing password hashes or spread around the network that way. So all you need is a couple minutes in the building and then you get the hell out. The cops are going to take at least a few minutes. And even if the cops show up, you still have the option of running. Uh, working on the treadmill is pretty important as a pen tester. I have had to run quite long distances, including from armed guards, and it has really paid off to, to be at least in somewhat good shape. So one of the bank branches, we just popped that latch and got right in. Uh, they didn't have a sound alarm. You can check for those alarms. There's usually a magnetic connector on the top of the door or somewhere around the door frame. Um, so we real quick just scanned that to make sure there's no electronics in the door frame. Uh, made sure there was no silent alarm and then just went to town, you know, eating their snack food and finding all the good stuff. Now the fourth technique is what we use for the headquarters building. And that is the canned air trick. I love this trick. It is highly, highly effective. It takes advantage of this thing. This is a REX sensor, a request to exit sensor. I actually noticed this building has one of these in the main doors. I didn't know how common these were in Europe because I have only done a couple gigs here. Uh, but I have seen them in a lot of buildings in the past couple days. So I do think that this is going to be a somewhat universal one. Uh, these are everywhere in America because of fire code. Fire code says when there's a fire, you have to be able to escape even if the doors are locked. So what this is, is it measures heat and motion. This is going to be on the inside of the door, not on the outside, so that if someone's running towards the door and the doors are locked, this thing will unlock the door because it notices motion and temperature change. It's actually not heat, it's temperature change, which we are going to exploit using one of these, a canned air keyboard cleaner. These things are really great because check out what happens when you turn them upside down and spray them. Minus 46 degrees Celsius. Minus 49 Celsius. That's fantastic. That's a huge temperature change. And you can see that it makes a big cloud. When you just spray this upright, it's just, it just looks like see-through air. It doesn't help anybody. Turn it upside down, though, and now you have this massive cloud of coldness coming through the door. So this is the easiest way of taking advantage of REX sensors. You just put that little, that little, um, what is that, that little tube that it comes with. It's super, super narrow. You just shove it between the two doors, turn it upside down, spray it, pops right open. This is a bank headquarters. I just walk up to the door in a suit and tie, spray it, and I'm in a bank headquarters. This stuff works flawlessly. I love this trick. I always have canned air on me, uh, just in case. Just like I have the hall pass on me, just in case. But there's actually some variations to this one. One of the variations, um, because you only need to have heat, uh, a ch change in temperature and motion, there's an enormous amount of things you can do to shove into or under or around that door that creates a temperature change in motion. So check this one out. So we're locked, but there's a rack sensor up there. You can heat things up in your mouth and spit them out as long as they're not perfectly clear. I think you can even use water. Uh, so one of my coworkers had to get into a data center. And he didn't, it was about 4 a.m. No stores were open. They're in the middle of like nowhere. I don't know, Nebraska, Iowa, somewhere in like the Midwest or something. And this was a highly secured data center. But one of these side doors was these, was, I'm sorry, he got inside because a window was installed backwards. So he just unscrewed the window and removed it and popped in there. And then once he was inside, he had to get to this secured data center, like headquarters, uh, headquarters place, the, uh, like the main room that houses all the secure servers. And in order to do that, they had a rec sensor uh, behind the door. And the door was RFID and locked. And he, uh, I don't think he was allowed to pick it or anything like that. But it's 4 a.m. And it's, there's, there's nothing open. You can't just go to Lowe's. Uh, he wasn't quite prepared for this. So what's open at 4 a.m. is sex shops. So he got a blow-up doll and just unrolled it, shoved it underneath the door, and then started blowing it up and then waving it around. So the heat from his breath warmed her up, and she, in turn, thanked him by opening the door for him. So there's a lot of variations on all of these. Once you know like the fundamental tenets of why these security measures work, there's, you can get really creative with how you bypass them. Uh, you could pee through the door. I've heard of that working quite well. If you have no other options, you can just shoot a stream in there. It's warm and it changes the, uh, uh, the motion. The fifth technique 
is going to be sliding underneath the door. If there's enough of a gap, then you can just do this. <laughs> Most of the time, there's not going to be enough of a gap. And when there's not enough of a gap, we're going to take advantage of these door handles. Now, I do notice these a lot less in Europe. Uh, this is an, a door handle that conforms to Americans with Disabilities Act. This is an act that says that, you know, that's the act that put the parking spaces all over the place for the handicapped cars. It's the act that says door handles have to be accessible for people with handicaps who can't grip strongly or anything like that. So they, they made them look like this because this is much easier for someone with, um, who's missing a hand or something to open the door. More so than those circular doorknobs that I see all over the place, especially in Europe like something like that or those. Those are going to be a lot harder to do this trick on. Probably still possible, but hard. You're going to take advantage of these. And you're going to take advantage of them with this piece of metal fishing rod. It's very difficult to explain how this works. And this picture does not tell you any clues about, you know, what you're supposed to do with this. So let's take a look at a real quick video. Helps to you slide it under the door. So you hold on to that metal ring. You only need a tiny bit to catch it. And you pull both the drawstring and the tool, and if the door opens away from you, not only do you pull the tool, but you got to push with your head. Yeah, so that's it. You just slide it underneath. You're holding on to that little loop on the bottom. One hand's on the, on the metal loop on the bottom, and the other hand is in that ring. And so you slide it under, you lift it up, you put your ear to the door, you listen for where it's scraping, you get it right on the door handle, and then you just pull that loop, pull that, uh, that little metal string. And that makes it flex, causes the door handle to turn, and you're in. So this is another one of these techniques that is less likely to get you in from the, ex, from the outside of the building, but it will get you everywhere once you're inside the building. This, uh, this one actually gets me much farther on the inside of buildings than the hall pass does, because sometimes there's special latches that have preventative measures for the hall pass, like it's like a double latch that prevents the hall pass from working. But this thing works amazingly all over. It's so hard to fix this problem because the gaps underneath these doors, I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to make it harder for the door to open to make that door secure from this attack because you have to have incredibly tight tolerances. Now think about if there's carpet. If there's carpet, what are you going to do? A piece of metal down there and now everyone opens the door. They're going to like jerk it open. No one is going to sacrifice convenience for security. I feel like we've learned that already. So this is an extremely, extremely hard one for a company to fix. There's a variation on this one too. Let's say they do fix it. Let's say it's a metal floor and there's a metal piece of metal on the bottom of the door that prevents anything from getting underneath. Um, hotels are actually quite good at this. Hotels are, um, especially in America, are very good at having tight, tight tolerances between the bottom of their door and the floor. Well, you can just go above it in that case. What you can do is take 35 millimeter film, make a loop out of it. It's thin and it's strong. So you can just slide it up through the top or through the side of the door if you think that's going to work, but I think the top usually works better. Slide it through. And this is much harder because it's harder to tell where the loop is on the other side of the door as compared to having a piece of metal scraping where you can hear it. Uh, but you take that loop and you just keep feeding it and feeding it until you feel like you're about at the door handle. You hook the door handle, you pull down on that film. Now you've just bypassed what I know as uh, the only protection against this uh, attack. The K-22 is what that's called. Helps to... Okay, so that was the... Those were the five uh, educational techniques. How much time do I have? About half an hour. So I'm just going to tell you some stories now at this point. Here's where the tales come in. Because um, those techniques aren't always going to work. Those will work the large majority of the cases. But sometimes, sometimes you're breaking into something really secure. So one time, we were tasked, me and Justin Wynn actually, were tasked with breaking into one of the most expensive skyscrapers in New York City. It was right, on, right in the middle of Manhattan. Um, really beautiful views. Uh, absolutely gorgeous place. We were tasked by one of their employees, or one of the companies leasing a floor on, on that skyscraper, to break into their place. Uh, we knew this was going to be really hard, because New York has very tight security. In order to get into this building, there's four entrances. There were the only four entrances we could find. Uh, I circled this place a million times. Four entrances. All four entrances have a guard. And getting, bypassing guards usually requires some kind of deep social engineering. 
You're not going to be able to like just walk in with your burglary set in your backpack and then spill some coffee on the ground and then just like sprint. You're going to have to probably figure out a trick to get by those guards. I don't like dealing with guards. Anytime I get the opportunity, I'm breaking in after hours. I'm not dealing with human beings. I'm going to use one of those techniques other than the cleaning crew. Uh, and I'm just going to try and break in so I have all the time in the world. And I don't have to trick anybody because some people are very suspicious. It's, it's much easier to bypass physical security mechanisms than it is mental ones most of the time. So what we did is we called up the company that owns this building. We pretended to be from a major healthcare organization from their research team. And we were pretending to be like a small group of Harvard grads who this research team had invested all this money in. That's why we were so young, but uh, you know, little young research geniuses. And we were going to get a really swanky office in this, uh, um, this New York skyscraper. So we had to cover for the fact that we were young because most of the people in that building are going to be a little bit older. They're going to be in the finance world and everything. Um, so I called them up and I spoke to my first billionaire, one of the owners of the company. He talked just like a billionaire. He said about three words, told me to get the hell off his phone and call this other guy. He has nothing to do with this. So I get off, I call the other guy, and he schedules me for a real estate tour. We get up to the real estate tour. Me and Wynn are, you know, we're decked out in our suits and everything, pretending to be like little young geniuses, little Silicon Valley geniuses that this uh, healthcare company had given us millions and millions and millions of dollars for so we could afford this place. And Justin gets a little tummy ache. He, we're up on the 50th floor or something, and we're just taking pictures of the views and all that kind of stuff. And, and Justin's like, oh man, I ate some bad chicken or something in that street vendor outside. Uh, could, do you mind if I go check out a restroom? Um, and the guy, the tour agent, who got us right past the guards. He just says, you know, like waves at the guard. The guard already knows him. So we bypass the guards that way, take the elevator up. He says, yeah, of course. Like there's a bathroom uh, down that like one floor or something. And Wynn's like, oh my God, no, I think I'm going to throw up. I'm just going to head out. Or I'm only, I'm a two minute walk from this place. I'm just, I got to bounce. Dan, can you take care of this? And uh, I'm like, of course I can, yeah. So he bounces out. And what he actually does is goes down two floors. So he goes down two floors to an empty floor. The f we thought it was empty, I should say. But it's, uh, it looks like it's under construction. There's like no carpet, there's, there's no offices, nothing like that. So he ends up going to the bathroom, but the men's bathroom was locked. The women's bathroom was the only one that was unlocked. We assume this has had something to do with construction. I, who knows why? So he goes in there and he sits down and he's just chilling there for like half an hour. I bounce out of there, I go home, I'm having sushi, I'm having a good time, and he's still stuck up there. So what happens is the door opens to the bathroom after about an hour of waiting and he sees Two women's feet walk into the bathroom, pointing right at his stall that he's sitting in, and then immediately turn around and leave. And he's like, oh, crap. <laughs> I've, he's got big old man feet, so I have the feeling that those women could tell that that was not another woman in that stall, and they call security. Security comes up. They go, uh, like, they knock on all the doors, like all the stalls and stuff, and at first he's just being quiet because he doesn't want to give, give himself away or anything. But eventually he realizes that there's no getting out of this one. So the security knocks on the doors and he goes, oh, I'm so sorry, I just have a stomach ache. Like I, I had to run down here from, I'm on a, a, a tour upstairs. Uh, I had to go down here, I'm so embarrassed. Like I just, if you give me 10 minutes, I will be out of your hair, out of this whole place. And the security guards apparently thought that was good enough. And they were like, all right. So he waits for them to get to the elevator. He hears the elevator doors shut and leave. And their mistake was leaving. They should have, somebody should have waited there with him. I mean, it's a man in a woman's bathroom on an empty floor in a skyscraper. Like, this, this is not okay. So that was their mistake. He did name drop the company we were working for along with our point of contact, which probably helped because I'm sure the guards know the main people that work and live in that building. So I'm sure that was useful in that case. But he ended up... Uh, as soon as he heard that elevator door close, he gets out of that bathroom, he runs to the stairwell. He runs up to the stairwell, to the very top of it, hides there, he has no food and no water. And it's like 2 p.m. So he can't get food and water. I'm trying to sit there and think of ways I can like chuck a water bottle up 50 flights of stairs, but I didn't think that was gonna work. So he's stuck there. I'm sitting, sitting there on the outside and watching the lights on the floor he's on to tell them when they go out. Well, funny story, they never go out. It's New York and it's a finance sector. Those people are working all the time. 7 p.m. rolls around. He's like, dude, I am dying right now. I'm, I'm thirsty. I have to go to the bathroom, but I can't move. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, let's, just, I guess you can go ahead and try and get into their, their building now. I mean, it's 7 o'clock. They should be going home, right? It's past 5. He's like, yeah, yeah, okay. So he gets the hall pat, the, um, the K-22, which is the under the door tool, he goes to the stairwell entrance. One thing to know, in office buildings, stairwells are 
golden. They're absolutely golden. Stairwell doors are often the least secured of any of the doors in that building. So he goes to the stairwell, goes to the floor they're on, and he uses it under the door tool, just slips underneath. It's an RFID reader door. Uh, he couldn't haul pass it. I don't think it was haul passable. Um, so he does the under the door trick, opens up that door, and the door opens up into the office. So he has a backpack full of burglary tools, like night vision and, and thermal optics and, and lock picks and everything in his backpack. His backpack also has a big skull and crossbones on it. I, why he didn't carry a briefcase, I'll never know, but you know. So he gets in there, he turns the corner from the stairwell into the main portion of this office, and he sees about 30 heads whip to him because it's New York and it's the finance world, they're still working. So he's a pen cam, and boy, if it was legal, I would show you some of this footage, because it's gold. He's got a pen cam right here, he sees all these heads whipped towards him, and he's in a backpack, he's like, he just doesn't look like he belongs at all. He starts walking and makes a beeline for the door, just straight to the door. There's a picture of a guy who's staring at him with a an expression of horror the entire time he's walking by, just like this. <laughs> and he didn't want any confrontations, so he bounces out of there. He goes back to his hiding place up in the stairwell. No one, I mean, even if they did try and confront him, he was just going to walk out anyway. He's going to be like, oh, uh, uh, I was just here doing some maintenance on, on whatever. And then he was just going to run. Like, he wasn't going to let anyone prevent him from running. Running is very important, you have to see, and climbing stairs. So he gets back to his hiding place, and he's like, oh my god, I still haven't eaten in like 10 hours, and I haven't had a sip of water, but you just got to ride it out, because there's no going back now. So I'm sitting there on the bottom still, you know, popping my sushi, being like, yeah, the lights are still on. <laughs> it's 11 p.m., lights are still on. It sucks to be you. So 11 p.m. rolls around. He's like, dude, I, I'm just going to die if I don't get this done. So he finally, under the door, tools at this time, and now there's no one there. Perfect does the network drop, gets access, and uh, that was how we succeeded on a New York skyscraper with guards. Guards, the, the point of that lesson here is that guards usually require social engineering. And to social engineer them, you take advantage of someone they trust. In this case, that was the leasing agent. There's always gonna be someone a guard trusts that can get you in. You generally are not gonna be social engineering the guard themselves. Um, I have seen, pe a lot of people will go into buildings and they'll just say, hey, I'm a printer repair tech, take me to your printer. Um, and the guards almost never want any part of that. They'll be like, who, who, who's your contact here? What, who am I supposed to call about this? They always want to call somebody. So you have to give them somebody to call. Uh, you can do things like send fake emails. Uh, one time I was at a bank, and I had to break in during office hours. I wasn't allowed to come in at night, and those are always harder gigs. So I sent a spoofed email from the manager's account, I just used like an online form or something. You can, uh, email headers are very easy to spoof, so you can spoof the to and the from. And I knew that they were using a crappy email program that didn't have good spam filtering. So I just sent a fake email pretending to be from the, manager, the bank manager's office. And I also knew the bank manager had a meeting at, uh, at a certain time on a certain day because it was listed on their website. So I sent an email saying, hey, uh, I'm going to be in this meeting from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., I have uh, someone coming to work on my computer during that time, and I sent that to the front desk. And I sent it to the front desk right after she left for the meeting. So there's no way the front desk can just turn around and be like, oh, hey, you know, you could have just told me that. So that's another example of how you might get in uh, using social engineering rather than one of these physical security tricks. Uh, oh, let me tell you about my first bank job, because that was actually, that job I just described was uh, the second one. The first bank job, I didn't even know that physical security was a part of this job. I was a, I was a, I got hired to be a network hacker and a web app hacker. So they tell me, hey, you got to uh, break into this bank and you got to get network access. Uh, it has to be office hours again. I hate these gigs. I hate it when it's office hours only. I just don't want to interact with these people. So office hours roll around and I go in. I have a fake badge, as usual. I have um, a pretext that I go up to the bank manager with. And this, again, this was one of my earliest gigs, so it's not going to be necessarily the most sophisticated one. But I go in and I say I'm from IT. I know the VP. I know the VP of IT. I start dropping names. John Wagonblast. It's not his real name, obviously. I'm like, John Wagonblast sent me here. We're getting a lot of packet loss between your branch and the headquarters. So if you guys could just show me to a computer real quick, we're going to do some little diagnostics there. And the guy's like, oh, oh, OK. And he looks at my badge, and he looks at my fake ID. And he's like, OK, well, we have a cubicle over here and an office over here. And I'm like, I'll take the office. Thanks. I'm going to the office. And he and I'm like, okay, hey, can you, can you log in for me real quick? As if an IT employee doesn't have 
I'll log in. And he goes, yeah, yeah, of course, okay. He logs in. He's like, okay, let me just go call John real quick. I'll just verify that you, you're supposed to be here at this time. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm already, you know, dumping his passwords, uh, um, using tools like lasagna from back in the day. Dumping all his clear text passwords from his, wi from his, um, his Wi-Fi, from his uh, Outlook, from his web forms, all that kind of stuff. So I'm already in great shape. I can probably go impersonate this guy when I get home, even if he kicks me out right there. He leaves. He can't get a hold of John because I came exactly when John goes to lunch. I know John's never going to answer his office phone if he's not in the office. He comes back five minutes later. He goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I, I can't get a hold of John. I'm so sorry. I, I, I can't let you continue because I, I just don't know who you are necessarily. Like, I don't know if you have permission to do this. And I'm like, oh, John really needs these trace routes. I mean, he was adamant that he wanted these very quickly. And he's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, I just want to help. Like, but I just, I can't though. I just, I can't. I'm so sorry. After five minutes of arguing, I pretend to get pissed off, slam my laptop closed, you know, stare at him for a minute and then start walking out. As I'm walking out, I turn around and I say, listen, can, can I just get a cup of coffee or something, please? And he's like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. The break room is right over here. The break room's right over here. I'm like, all right, all right. You're a good guy. You're a good guy. He lets me in there, and I immediately start searching for any kind of Ethernet jacks I can find. Anything. Um, printers, phones, uh, even refrigerators sometimes nowadays. I'm just scaling the walls looking for an Ethernet jack somewhere so I can plug back in and start stealing more stuff. Because this is my first bank job. I want to push the limits. I don't want to just be like, hey, I'm going to get out of here now. He, he got me. I mean, I, I succeeded, but I, he got me. I'm like, I want to crawl through the ceiling and do some splinter cell shit, something like that. So I can't find an Ethernet jack. And I'm sitting there thinking about my options. I'm like, okay, it's a drop ceiling. I can go in the ceiling. There's a bathroom over there. I can hide in a stall. Neither of those sound like a good idea because they're going to take too long. And I'm just going to get caught in the bathroom. But the office is still open and the lights are off. And it's right around the corner. So why don't I just go back to the office? So I head back into the office, and I crawl underneath the desk. The way the desk is set up, it's facing the, the door. There's about a two inch gap between the bottom of the desk and the door frame. So the lights are off. I know he can't see me, because I'm behind this like curtain on the, on, the, uh, on the desk. And I go back to town. I've got my laptop out underneath the desk, just happily hacking away in the dark. Green text flying across my screen. And then a couple minutes later, I see his feet because I can only see the, top, like, the bottoms to the tops of his feet. And I see him walk towards the break room because I've been in there for like 15 minutes and you know, there's no coffee to be had. So I pray. I'm just sitting there. My heart is pounding. I see the footsteps and I hear him start coming back. And I'm like, just, just walk right by. Walk right by. Don't don't look in here. He can look, he wouldn't be able to see me, but he would eventually, if he walked in, he would. So I see his feet just walk right by, and they stop right in front of the office door. And I see his toes point into the door, and I'm like, crap, crap. He takes a couple steps in, he looks under the desk, and he sees my smiling face with green text flying across my screen, going, John really needs those trace routes, and then going back to hacking. <laughs> couldn't have been more than um, 60 seconds of him standing over me, slack-jawed, wondering what to do in this situation, when I was like, I can't take the pressure anymore. I, I cracked. I'm like, okay, I'm done. Close my laptop. And this was when he said, or he got a little suspicious. <laughs> so he looks at me. I'm closing my laptop off. I'm like, great, I got all, I got all the stuff. And he's like, can I... Can I see that laptop real quick? I just want to make sure it's, it's branded with our company. It's like a, it's a, you know, an issued laptop. And I'm like, yeah, OK. Hand him my laptop. He starts spinning it around like this, you know, inspecting it, looking at the service tags, all this stuff. And he nods, gives it back to me. I'm like, OK, I guess that's it. <laughs> and uh, the only mistake I made here was on the way out. If you successfully do a social engineering gig, you don't tell them you were social engineering them at the end of that gig. So I slide that paper across. I didn't know that. I slide the get out of jail free card in front of him, and I see his face just, the color drains from his face. And he was such a nice guy. It really kind of ruined the entire engagement. So I've never done that again. Now I just leave, and they can learn next week that uh, I didn't actually work for that place. Let's see. What's, uh, how much more time do I have? 15 minutes? OK, I'm going to tell a real quick one, and then I'll take a couple questions. The water treatment facility, oh, I'm sorry, the casino gig, that was a fun one. Well, you got to break into a casino, it was a red team. Anything goes again, fish them, impersonate them, pick a lock, break in, you know, anything except breaking doors and stuff. This was an engagement that we had done 
for three years in a row, and every year this casino has gotten better and better. They fixed everything that we got them with every single year, and I knew this was going to be really difficult. So I walk in there, and it was like the holy grail just lit up in front of me. I, I, I assumed that this was going to be uh, like a 50-50 chance of failure just because of how good they were in the previous years. In the previous years, we'd actually only gotten them on a two-week engagement. We got them on the second Friday of that two-week engagement. The final day we could have gotten them, we got network access and DA and all that stuff. So I'm like, this is, no one's gonna blame me if I fail on this one. It's a casino, they have very good security, cameras everywhere, and entire teams watching those cameras 24 hours a day. But, as soon as I walked in, I see the business center. And the business center is where you can print out documents and stuff at hotels and everything. It was closed, and I'm like sprinting up to my room as soon as I saw that business center was closed because that gives me a perfect pretext to make the clerk open up my file from a USB. I put a little uh, macro document on my USB. It's one of those uh, macros that as soon as you hit, it's, it's, it looks like it's encoded or encrypted prior to hitting enable macros. As soon as you hit enable macros, it like decrypt, it says like decrypting and flashing letters and then you know a skull and crossbones pops up and, and now you get an actual document. So I put one of those on there. I give it to the clerk. I say, hey, listen, man, like, I, I have a meeting in like three minutes. I really, really need to print this out. Your business center's closed. Like, how is your business center closed? You're a hotel. You're supposed to be able to print stuff. And he's like, oh, okay, 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 here you go. And hands me, gets the USB, sticks the USB in, sees it's all like weird encryption nonsense. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's macros. You just have to enable the macros. That's it. Just hit that button. And he's like, mm, okay. And he hits the button. And then as soon as he hits that button, there's like a three second pause and I hear my phone buzz and I'm like, oh, God bless America. Uh, I knew I had the shell there. And so from there, we were able to just start bouncing around. We did the credential shuffle, if anybody's familiar. He was an administrator on like one other computer. And so I go into that one, I dump all the credentials from that one. I find another person that's an administrator on one other computer. I go into that one and dump all the credentials and so on and so forth till we had DA. So we get DA, it is the first day that we have been at this casino and we're done. And so I go to my boss and I'm like, yo man, can we like goof off now? Like can we just start, like we have, the, we have everything we need. And he's like, I didn't tell him how we were gonna goof off, strategically. Uh, and he was like, yeah, I guess so. You guys did a good job. So first we, uh, we robbed them of money. The way we did that is they had a player database system. We found all the connections that were, conne um, that were attached to these certain computers. Cer certain computers have lots of connections coming to them. We noticed one of them was a database server. So we hop in the database server. We see it's uh, the player point system. Player point is worth like five cents. Every time you put a dollar into a slot machine, it gives you like one player point. It's like one penny or five cents or something. But that's just a number in a database. However, you can exchange those for real cash at the uh, cashier. So we're like, okay, well, now we're millionaires. Fantastic. Okay, done. Monday. Let's start goofing off. So I was thinking, I didn't really think that my room was quite up to par. My room was a little small. It, was, it didn't have a lot of amenities. I really wanted a nicer room. So I hop on the CEO's email account, and I send an email to the front desk. I'm like, there's a couple contractors here that done some really good work. I actually didn't say a couple. I actually gave myself the room alone. I didn't help my buddy out at all. I was like, this, this guy, Dan McInerney, has done some great work for us in the past, and I'd like you to give him a, a suite and whatnot. And I send it off. And I go down about 20 minutes later, and they must have noticed just from the smile on my face that I was the man that was getting this suite, because I'm just strolling up to that place. And they're like, uh, Dan? And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> Drop those keys right in there. I am up there on the top level presidential suite. There's like an Olympic-sized swimming pool in my room and a high dive. It was awesome. And then we, uh, after that, uh, it, was, it was all downhill, actually, because apparently what I didn't know was that oftentimes CEOs' emails will go through their secretary first and then out to its actual um, person that's supposed to go to? I didn't know that. I know that now, and all of you know that now, so please never make this mistake either. Because it seems like a really easy thing to do. You just hop on the CEO's email and you just send emails all you want. No, those emails are going through the secretary. The secretary asked the CEO, uh, well, what was this about? Like, who, who, why did you send this? I've never seen you send an email to the front desk before. And he's like, nope, didn't send that. So they find my room, and I get a knock. We were just about to go out again and go break into their golf course and then go steal some golf carts. <laughs> just because we can, because we already beat them. And we're just going to have some joy rides. Uh, I get a knock on my door, and it's very authoritative. And I look out that door, that little, uh, that little 
peephole, and I see like eight cops standing like a, like a bunch of linebackers, just waiting for me to try and sprint out so they could just grab me and tackle me, uh, open up the door, and, they're, and they see me, and they're like, you look like you've been expecting us. And I'm like, well, I wasn't really, but uh, I am now. So we actually got caught on that one because of that email CEO. So future reference, don't send emails to the CEO's account unless you know it's not going through. You get to delete his filters, delete uh, all of the routing and stuff, and you can probably do it, but I didn't do it on that one. All right, that's, I'm running out of time, I believe, so let me take a couple questions here. Any questions? If not, I have more stories. Yes? Yes. Um, I don't know if all of them do. I know some of them do. I would venture to say... In my experience, I've definitely seen door handles at work going up and down. Sometimes that's not been the case, though. I, I don't know what the percentage is here. I would say most of them work going up, but that's my best guess. They, they, it does sometimes work. Uh, that's where the, the film trick comes in, because you're pulling that door handle up rather than down. Any other questions? All right, real quick story then. We, uh, we were doing a water treatment facility. This was awesome. We had thermal and night vision. We're all camoed out. We actually, um, we were using face paint, and when you're real pale like me, it actually makes a massive difference to paint your skin dark tones, greens, blues, blacks, uh, and then go, because the water treatment facility is in the woods, and they had lights all around them and stuff, and you disappear when you're putting on some camouflage face paint and stuff in the, in the pitch black of the woods of um, the East Coast. So we drew in that. We did that for a couple of nights. We broke in. We used the thermal to track the guards. We hopped over all their uh, barbed wire fences. Barbed wire fences are a joke. They're essentially a ladder into the place. You just take a piece of carpet, throw it over the fence. Now you're not going to get popped. And you just climb the fence like a ladder. It's so stupid. There's like 12 foot barbed wire fences. And, and this was actually also with Justin Wynn. Um, we were like, oh no, that looks like it's going to be hard to get over. And then, of course, you get over the first one and you're like, this is silly. I don't know why people even use this for security. So we, we're doing that for a couple of nights. We start running low on our face paint and stuff. Uh, our favorite colors were green and blue. Uh, they, just, they just blended really nicely. So we just used the colors we had left. Um, and so we're pretty like completely covered from head to toe in the stuff. So we go get some food right after this. We're, we're geared up. We're ready to go. We want to get a little energy in us before we go. So we pull into this fast food place. We hand the guy our money. And he looks at us like we're crazy people. Like he wanted to punch us in the face. And he just tosses the bag in our car. And we're like, what the fuck was that about? Like, that's weird. And then we look at each other as we're saying, that's weird. And we're like, oh my god, we're in blackface. <laughs> <laughs> On that same engagement, we were coming through. In order to get to the place, we can't park in the, there's a, there's a, a community park north of the water treatment facility. It's in a pretty isolated location surrounded by woods. The community park, we can't park there because the, the parking is flat. And it would be the only car there. And the park is closed. Cops will show up. Uh, guaranteed. So we had to park in a residential neighborhood about one block north and then find a pathway, like a city-owned pathway, to get back to this park and start wandering into this water treatment facility. We get past one of these houses, so we're walking on this path that goes to this park, and, on, and we're in a suburban setting. There's, there's houses all around us. We walk past one house as this pathway cuts through them, and a dog lights up on us. I mean, just goes crazy yapping at us, and we are in camo and face paint and we are have giant backpacks with grappling hooks and stuff in them. This is not where we want to get caught. We don't want anyone to see us at this point. It's probably midnight, I would say. This dog goes insane. The loudest little yapper I've ever heard. And after, like, we freeze for a second before we're like, well, crap, do we just start running? Like, we don't see anyone around us. What do we do in this situation? Uh, turns out, the owner of the dog, as soon as he hears the dog start, like, lighting up, he goes... Look, Fenton! Fenton, get the hell in here! Will you shut the hell up, Fenton? He is screaming at this dog as loud as that dog was screaming at us. And that dog looks so sad. He, he like, goes into the living room of this guy's house because his back door was open, and he's just sitting there, like, you know, nervously shaking his tail while he looks up, and then he looks at us again, and he looks back at his owner, and we're like, sucker. So the one time this dog actually lights up on real-life burglars, he gets the crap yelled out of him. Uh, that house is not going to be safe for many years to come. I think that's the end of my time. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you guys learned something.
and uh, have a good rest of your week.